ACAN are pleased to be hosting our 12th event on building with natural materials. This time, the eighth of our masterclass, which is about novel natural materials. We've got some great minds from across the industry presenting tonight, presenting some really unique materials, followed by a panel session where the speakers will be able to answer your questions posted in the chat box. I'd like to introduce Catherine Larson from Studio Catherine Larson. Catherine will share with us her research and work on how both seaweed and seagrass can be used in architecture. Ward Massa from Stone Cycling will follow and explain to us their work in the de development of waste-based bricks, slips and tiles and associated bio cements. And we will continue with Duncan Baker Brown from Baker Brown Architects, who will talk us through some of the excellent case studies using novel materials. Before we kick off, I'm sure most of you already know about ACAN and some are involved in the network, but for the benefit of others in the room, Barry will give a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. Hi everyone. Um, so for anyone new to ACAN, we are an open voluntary network of individuals in the built environment industry. Formed in April 2019, this group has now grown into a global network of over 3,000 people. It started with a vision for how we could work autonomously as a collection of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. Our manifesto has three overarching aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. You can read a bit more in detail about these here on your screen, but also on the ACAN website. ACAN is made up of many groups and this includes these nine main thematic groups of which natural materials is one. Each group is made up of individuals who want to make change happen and a couple of people from each group take a coordination role to help facilitate the group and move forward any actions. So you can hear more about what else is going on in the other groups by joining ACAN and we'll share a link in the other groups in the chat box later on. So back to Andy now to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Bowie. I would like to introduce our first speaker of the night, Catherine Larson from Catherine Larson, Studio Catherine Larson. Catherine is fascinated by building traditions and rare construction techniques of the past and specialises in natural building materials. Most notably, her research focuses on, on how seaweed and seagrass can be used in architecture. Her 2018 thesis, Seaweed Thatch Reimagined, was nominated as a finalist for several awards, most notably the 2020 SDG Copenhagen Tech Awards, People's Choice. In 2021, her collective design and architecture work with eelgrass and kelp was a finalist for the 2021 Green Concept Award. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen now with my slides, but I need to be a co-host first to do that. Sorry, I'm just uh, doing that in a second, so. No worries. Awesome. All right. Um, so my name is Katherine Larson. Um, I'm based in Copenhagen, but I'm originally from the US, as you might guess from my accent. Um, and I run a research and design studio called Studio Katherine Larson. And I also work um, as a regular architect at the moment for Anderson and Sigurdsson Architects in Copenhagen. Uh, but my research design studio focuses on materials and how we used to use materials in the past. One of the things that I've always been fascinated from since I was very little is the very old building traditions that we have as a people and how that connects us culturally to the area that we lived in. When I moved to Denmark in 2015, the material that both surprised me and fascinated me was uh, this material called seagrass. Um, and I was fascinated by a local version of seagrass here called eelgrass. Um, I was fascinated by it because they built massive roofs out of it on the island of Lesu, and I couldn't wrap my head around it. I wanted to know how were these roofs made? How do you, how do you thatch with seagrass? I never even encountered this before. Um, so I ended up focusing my thesis on this and trying to not only rediscover how this process was done, but also write about it, translate it for a wider audience. So historically, the thatching process on the island of Lesu was actually done by women. It was their job to gather the seagrass that 
came up on the shores every autumn season and uh, spread it out on a field to be rained on and dried. And basically this would process the seagrass so that it would become rot resistant. Then in the spring, construction on a new roof could begin. So the women began to gather up these large masses of seagrass and they began twisting it into massive ropes. Um, in Danish, these ropes are called vask. Then on the bottom rungs of these uh, timber frame houses, they attach these vask like ropes on the first couple of layers. And then they put pine branches on top um, and they pile even more seagrass on top. So you have these dramatically large roofs that are up to a meter thick, um, almost looks like a, a yak of a house. Um, and then the very important last step was to actually dance on the roof to compress it all together because seagrass has a natural binder in it. So when I found out about this process, I was fascinated and fascinated with seagrass as a material because not only is it rot resistant when processed in this way, it's also a fantastic source of natural insulation. And the more I dove into it, the more I realized that seagrass has been used around the world for hundreds of years as a source of natural insulation and was even one of the first uh, form of insulation bats in the US for a primitive uh, form of insulation bat called Cabot's quilt, which consisted of eelgrass sewn in between two pieces of cardboard paper. So I guess our grandparents, they kind of knew what they were doing when it came to seagrass, even though we've all kind of forgotten about this material. Today, the uh, seagrass farming industry has sprung up again. Um, I've been really lucky and fortunate to work with Moon Tang in the south of Denmark. Um, this is the old school farmer, Kurt. He's been farming it since he was a child in the 1950s. The business died out because there was a global wasting disease which affected how much seagrass washed up and how we used it as a resource and was replaced widely by synthetics. But today there is a huge preservation effort in Denmark to restore the roofs of, of uh, Lesu and also use the wasted seagrass which is left to either decompose or buried in landfills to use it again in the building industry as a source of natural insulation. So it's being used again in projects. Kurt and his family are actually teaching a whole new generation of people around Denmark how to responsibly harvest and farm seagrass. Uh, so this is really exciting to be a part of this and to witness this. And I, of course, also had to get involved. I was so inspired by this thatching technique and tradition that I started trying to come up with ways that we could experiment and build with this material. So I came up with a concept for my uh, 2018 thesis to come up with a prefabricated thatch concept, which could be used on roof and facade. And uh, I tested this in a number of uh, testing pavilions, which were very public. Um, and I actually learned a lot about the construction and thatching with seagrass along this time period. I learned that uh, first off, my installations failed after two years, uh, but the real reason why they failed was not only because I had thatched too thinly, um, all the historical thatching techniques consist of about 800 millimeters to a meter thick. And that's because of the sheer weight of the seagrass keeps the whole construction compressed. But also on Moon, I came across because of Kurt, the seaweed farmer, he taught me uh, a technique from Moon where they thatch on gables and they leave a twig between the structure and use that to compress the whole seagrass thatch down. So compression and self weight of the material when thatching with seagrass is enormously important to have a successful construction. And this was something that was previously unwritten about, previously unstudied. So I wrote about it for uh, TU Delft's latest issue on bio-based materials for the Rumor magazine um, to try and increase this knowledge of working with this material and this history. So one of the things, because I was working so much with seagrass, um, people who are seaweed farmers started contacting me and saying, you can do this with seagrass, what could you do with algae? And the important thing to note is that seagrass and algae are two separate things. Basically, algae is not a plant. It's like super primitive. Like before plants were plants, you had algae kind of like floating around in the sea doing its thing. And then seagrass formed. It was like this half awkward stage between algae and grass. And it was basically a plant living in the seabed with roots and a whole rooting system. But algae is fundamentally different from seaweed. Sorry, seagrass. It's seaweeds and um, it's also composed of unicellular organisms. And in construction, it has a remarkably different application. So historically, seaweed was almost always used as a form of glue. 
Um, this was what I discovered while I was researching, and I published this also in my own thesis for TU Delft. And I experimented with using algae as both a glue, but also as a natural fiber for plasters. Um, typically, you can't use algae as a fiber, like you would use seagrass as like an insulation, because algae tends to rot. But when you use it as a fiber in connection with clay, the clay encapsulates the algae, sucks out the extra, extra humidity and the extra moisture and prevents it from rotting. So algae plus clay is a successful way to use algae as a fiber. Seagrass, on the other hand, can almost always be used as a fiber, can almost always be used as similarly to hay in construction. So this was a one-to-one -one test I did using it as a form of hay bale construction, but instead of the hay, we have seagrass and we have a seaweed clay plaster on top. This was another one-to-one -one -one prototype I developed for my thesis. This is again using seagrass as insulation and insulating blocks. And then we have clay um, and seaweed bricks on the left and we have a shell uh, mode bearing brick on the right. Um, I found also too that by using shell and algae glues in combination, I could come up with a sort of concrete replacement uh, that was very load bearing, uh, which is very interesting. And uh, basically for my thesis, I just combined a bunch of different material tests and kind of decide for the uh, Dutch building industry to use these materials, um, also waste materials again in construction. Um, but algae has lots of different applications. Um, I started doing more funky projects through my studio. Um, one of the cool projects I got to do for the Venice Biennial in 2021 was uh, looking at the algae in, uh, in the lagoon down there. And one of the issues they have is with invasive algae. Uh, there's a lot of algae that was brought on boats that tracked in from China and from Japan. And one of these algae was an invasive kelp called wakame. So for the Venice Biennial, I designed and made a stool that is covered in wakame kelp leather that I made by hand and sewed by hand. And the stool is stuffed with seagrass and it was installed as a part of the non-extractive architecture uh, installation down in Venice for the Biennial, which is really cool. Fun to be a part of that. And then the other funky project I did was for Gdynia Design Week. Um, again, experimenting with algae and the glue in algae and actually using that to create bioplastics. And I also experimented with using the seagrass as fiber. And again, seagrass has had a long tradition in history actually is also being used as upholstery stuffing. So we made this very visible upholstered chair, not extremely practical, but to demonstrate making the invisible visible again, this invisible history of using seagrass is upholstery um, and displaying it in this somewhat provocative way for the installation. Um, and finally, I wanted to get my hands on and get involved myself. Um, one of the things that people think of is that if it's a plant or like seagrass or if it's algae, that means that it's renewable. That means that we can take as much as we want. Um, this is not true. Seagrass beds are fundamentally threatened around the world. Um, so I, I got to volunteer with the seagrass um, conservation team down in the Netherlands and help replant a seagrass bed myself. And it was a lot of work because you have to dive down three meters and plant every single plant by hand under the sea into the seabed. And you have to hold your breath while you're doing that because you're wearing a snorkel. So it took me four hours and I replanted about four square meters. Uh, so that just gives you an insight into actually how much work it actually takes to bring back seagrass um, when it's gone as a resource. It's super difficult to bring back in the, and also in the UK you have the organization um, Project Seagrass that is really trying to uh, bring back the seagrass in the UK. Um, so seagrass is not like algae. You can grow algae on a rope. You can grow it on whatever you want in the sea, but seagrass requires a seabed because of the rooting system. So it is a resource that we need to protect and we need to be mindful of. So the future of my studio hopes to be continuing to communicate these ideas through design, but also hopefully communicating the important idea that we have to conserve our resources as much as we can rely on them. Um, and that's an important part to be aware of as an architect and as a designer. So. I will stop sharing now. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I, will, we will, I will now introduce Ward Massa from Stone Cycling. Um, 
Stone cycling creates beautiful building materials from 100% upcycled waste with a positive carbon impact to our, on our planet. Stone cycling's vision is that cities and their buildings will be constructed of building materials that are made from 100% waste, are 100% recyclable at the end of their life cycle and absorb more carbon than it takes to create them. So we'll do more. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for having mm -hmm. Oh, can you still hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. You were a little bit broken there, but oh, you want to just keep right. trying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my name is uh, Mark Massa. I'm one of the founders of Stone Cycling. And uh, for the last eight years, we have been uh, spending a lot of time in developing a new type of building material. And uh, I just want to start with the reason why we uh, founded the company and then uh, move into one of the new product groups that we have, the bio-based tile, and uh, share a little bit about that. Um, when we started the company, uh, we did uh, quite a bit of research and detected three main trends that we see in the, in the construction industry. Uh, start with the first one, uh, we found out that uh, if we look at uh, all the buildings that are being demolished, if we look at construction waste, uh, then uh, in Europe alone, uh, about 850 million tons of this material is becoming available every year. Uh, for the UK, it's about 65 million tons. For the Netherlands, we are based in Amsterdam. So it's, uh, it's around 25 million tons. And it's by far the biggest waste stream that we know in most countries. It's about 30 to 35% of all waste. This pile is growing every year because we build more, but also because the quality of the buildings that were being built in uh, the, the 80s and the 90s were of quite low quality. And a lot of these buildings are now being demolished. Um, when you demolish a building, at some point the building is gone, you can build a new building. But uh, we also started uh, doing a little bit of research on what is happening to this uh, material. And we actually found out that uh, most of this construction and demolition waste ends up as filling for roadbeds or buildings. So uh, uh, decades ago, this, uh, this material used to end up in landfills. Governments now say that they don't want uh, landfills anymore. So the industry uh, has been looking for a new solution and this is the best solution uh, that we can come up with. So as stone, as stone cycling, we, uh, we think this is a very low quality solution. Uh, there's a lot of uh, value uh, lost when the, the material ends over there. And uh, yeah, um, the other thing is that, especially in the Western European countries, most uh, roads infrastructure, infrastructure is already there. So the need for this material is not, uh, is not growing that, uh, that much anymore. Um, at the same time, uh, um, so on one hand, we demolish a lot. It's the biggest waste stream. On the other hand, a lot of new buildings are being built. Uh, I believe every five days, a city the size of Paris is being added to the worldwide built environment. So that it's a, a, a lot of buildings every, every five days. And all these buildings are made of, out of building materials. But these building materials are also made out of uh, raw materials or virgin materials. And if we look at the, the most used, most commonly used uh, 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 raw materials after water, uh, then it's sand and gravel. So the most used materials after water on this planet uh, are sand and gravel. And about 50 billion tons of this material is uh, extracted from the planet each year on such a, such a gigantic, uh, 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 such a fast pace that um, scientists already know this for decades that the pace uh, of, of extracting these materials uh, cannot go on like this. One, because it's very harmful for the envi environment, and two, because there are not enough materials to keep doing this. Uh, and that's a, that's, that's a big concern. So on one hand, we are creating this huge pile of waste, and on the other hand, uh, we are extracting all these materials from the planets to keep on the building. Um, the, the worldwide demand, for instance, for construction sand is so big uh, that it leads to a lot of illegal sand mining. Maybe some of you know this, but if you uh, zoom in uh, uh, under a microscope, if you put a, a grain of sand under a microscope, then you have different types of sand. But uh, um, uh, on average, you can say there is the round grain, which uh, is present in deserts, for instance, and you have a grain shape that is a hexagon-shaped grain, uh, a sand grain. 
And these grains are used for construction materials normally. And this type of sand can only be found in riverbeds, uh, sometimes at beaches, specific locations. So most of the sand uh, that we have in the world is not usable for, for construction materials. Um, uh, uh, illegal sand mining, of course, leads to co coast erosion, uh, leads, to, leads to flooding. It's not only far away, this happens quite a lot in Asia and the Middle East, but also in the Netherlands, we have been ex excavating uh, a lot of gravel from the rivers in the Netherlands. And now we find out that if you take gravel out of the rivers, then the sand under the gravel uh, it gets in contact with the water, it washes away, the river deepens, uh, it can deepen to five, six, seven meters. And now they find out that the infrastructure, the dikes and the bridges uh, alongside the river uh, are being threatened uh, by that. So the solution that is now being spoken of in the Netherlands is that we start excavating new gravel from Belgium, from the Ardennes, and then putting it back in the rivers here to prevent that from happening. So it's kind of a crazy development. This is a good example, uh, the Burj Al Khalifa in Dubai. Uh, I read a nice piece uh, uh, lately that this building should not have been built at all, uh, but that's that's a different uh, discussion. Uh, for this building, uh, you need a lot of concrete. For concrete, you need uh, sand, gravel, cement. We would say that there's plenty of sand available in, in Dubai, but the sand that was used for this building was imported from Australia. So for the, the, the past years, uh, these supply chains have become very long. A lot of the cement these days that was used in the Netherlands come from Germany or even from China. Uh, yeah, uh, so pile of waste growing, uh, uh, virgin materials becoming more scarce, and then of course carbon emissions. Eleven percent of the worldwide emissions have something to do with construction. And if you then zoom in on this eleven percent, on the right side we see that ninety percent out of this eleven percent uh, has actually to do with the production of building materials. So uh, the, con uh, the cement industry is one of the most polluting in industry because you have to fire limestone at 1400 degrees Celsius to create the cement, but also the, the ceramic industry, steel industry and other, other industry. And only 10% has to do with the actual construction of a building. So the movement of the trucks and stuff like that. Um, so as stone cycling, we see these developments and we set ourselves a very ambitious mission. Uh, when we fulfill our mission, we want to be able to uh, uh, create building materials that are made out of 100% out of upcycle waste with a positive carbon impact on our planet. So that's the mission and that's what we work towards. Um, which means that we try to put as much waste in our products as possible uh, by, use, uh, by using waste, we can, uh, we can decrease the need for, uh, for virgin materials we develop better technologies or we work together with other companies that have better technologies uh, so that we can produce them more efficient. Um, as, com as stone cycling, we don't produce ourselves, but the last eight years we've lined up the whole value chain to make this happening. Uh, so we work together with demolition companies saying to them that if they demolish in a more precise way, we are pay willing to pay a higher price for the material. Uh, we uh, work with recycling companies that crush the materials, we work with production companies that make our materials, technology companies, designers to develop new products and architects and real estate developers to create new buildings. Today we have two groups of products, the waste-based and the bio-based. For the sake of this meeting, I'm not uh, going to talk about the waste-based. You can find, uh, uh, find out about that on our website, but I'm going to zoom in on the bio-based. Uh, the bio-based tile is a new product that we introduced uh, uh, two months ago together with uh, an American company, maybe you have heard of them, Biomason. Uh, it's a super exciting uh, new technology uh, to replace uh, uh, Portland cement. As I said before, cement, uh, the cement industry is extremely polluting because uh, um, it's being created by firing limestone at 1400 degrees. And Biomason basically developed the technology that can do it differently. I'm trying going to show you a video, see if it works.
This is a new product that we introduced. It's called the bio-based tile. And I'm going to explain a little bit about the technology. Um, and um, Biomason, uh, when we started our company eight years ago, that's also when Biomason started, but they took a different route. We focused more on ceramics and they focused more on, on cement. And they actually started doing research on where, uh, where natural cement can be found in nature. Uh, and they ended up with coral reefs, but also shells. It's actually a type of limestone. Uh, uh, and they, f they found out that these coral reefs are formed by a certain type of bacteria that combine uh, calcium and carbon to create this material. Works very well, has been working like this for, for millions of years, uh, uh, but it goes very slow. So what they did is they were able to copy those uh, bacteria strains into the laboratory uh, and uh, um, uh, change the behavior of these bacteria, basically let them do the work much, far, uh, much faster. And they were also able to, uh, to, uh, to grow these bacteria on a massive scale. Uh, in the past few years, they, were able, they have been able to uh, uh, grow these bacteria on a massive scale, dry them into a powder, and this powder, this powder is actually a mix of materials, but mainly sleeping bacteria uh, mixed with, uh, with other uh, stuff. This, uh, this gray powder uh, is put into a mold together with 85% aggregate, and the aggregate that can be granite, byproduct, granite waste, a byproduct of the granite harvesting. It can also be construction, uh, construction and demolition waste or other aggregates. But it's mixed 15 percent of this material is mixed with 85 percent granite it's pressed into a mold and then food for the bacteria a kind of liquid is injected into the mold this liquid wakes up the bacteria and the bacteria start doing the same work as they do in nature they start combining calcium and carbon into a limestone like material under a microscope they uh, basically form a layer of glue between the chunks of uh, aggregate uh, so you see on this slide, you see four chunks of aggregate, and you see the layer that is uh, created by those bacteria between those chunks. And uh, within 60 hours, the, the, the bio-based tile cures at ambient temperature into a product that is stronger than concrete and lighter than concrete. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating technology. Uh, Biomason started with the idea of uh, developing a, uh, a, a brick, uh, the Biomason brick. But along the way, they figured out that this technology, technology can be uh, useful in, very, uh, in, in many different ways. So they, they changed their mission and they now want to, in the next 10 years, they want to replace 25% of, uh, of the worldwide uh, Portland cement with bio cement. They raised a lot of money er earlier this year to, to scale up their technology. Uh, but they already developed this first product and they also found a production partner in Denmark that said, we want to be the first one to experiment with this technology. So we are willing to build a factory for you where we can make this, uh, these tiles. Um, stone cycle, as stone cycling, we got in touch with Biomason because Biomason, they have, an, uh, they have about 100 scientists working over there, but they don't know that much about architecture or, or about the commercial side of the business. So we said, uh, uh, let stone cycling do the, ex uh, the aesthetic development of the product. Let us do the marketing and sales of the product. And let's, uh, together, let's make it a big success and actually show that there is a replacement for, uh, for ordinary Portland uh, cement. Um, it now results in two colors, gray and gray, uh, polished and honed. Uh, but uh, the future is looking very bright because this technology allows us to create a lot of different shapes and colors and textures. Um, the floor can now, uh, these tiles can now be used as uh, flooring, uh, they can be used as wall cladding, as facade cladding, uh, and uh, yeah, it basically is an alternative uh, for a cement based product or a ceramic product. As stone cycling, we don't stop there. Uh, we focus a lot of uh, effort, uh, we put a lot of effort in developing the products, but we also focus a lot on how these products are being uh, uh, um, applied in a, in a building or in an interior. So a lot of uh, a lot of the energy now goes into uh, remountable systems or uh, a dry stacking system that allows you to create a uh, bio-based tile facade, uh, not not by gluing the brick uh, the, the the tiles uh, against the back panel, but actually by uh, adjusting them mechanically so that you can also take them off in 30, 40, 50, or 60 years. Um, and especially for the retail, we work a lot with retail organizations. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary because 
uh, a Starbucks cafe, for instance, uh, they put a new interior in their shops and when, within three to five years, they take everything out and they start again. And up to today, uh, uh, a lot of these materials are thrown away because they are glued into an interior and we are developing ways to do that mechanically so that you can reuse the product. Um, as stone cycling, we have upcycled, it's, it's an old number, but we have upcycled uh, way more than 2 million kilos so far uh, and more than 100 projects in, uh, in 12 countries. This is an example of, of the bio-based tile uh, in a project in, in, in Denmark. Uh, I also have a couple of projects with the waste-based bricks or other bricks like this one in New York, Manhattan, interior in the Netherlands. Uh, we work with retail organizations with Kos and H&M in London for the ones who live in London, things work well. Glazings made from waste materials, interiors. Uh, all, all this to create a new stone age and to basically inspire the industry to start looking at material use, but uh, the use of waste and use of virgin materials in a totally different way. Uh, but in such a way that it can, it can really be upskilled and can be produced in the future regionally with regional waste uh, close to where the projects are. So that's, uh, that's uh, what we're uh, trying to do. And that's uh, my presentation. Thanks, Ward. Really interesting. Um, we'll now move on to Duncan Baker Brown from Baker Brown Architects, internationally recognized as pioneers in this field, experimenting with new designs, materials, and ways of working. Duncan's better known work includes our circular economy influence design for London's Greenwich Millennium Village, designing the, ha the house that Kevin built, the UK's first A star energy rated building, and creating the Waste House. Worst for the world's first building made of waste. Everything he does is designed to celebrate life, now, tomorrow, and for the long term. Thank you. Uh, th sorry, that, uh, those last two presentations are amazing. I'm just sort of <laughs> taking notes and things, forgetting I've got to contribute. So uh, focus, Duncan, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I'll start with the obvious. Uh, not is it sharing? No. Oh, That's there we go. It's, come, it's working now. Have you got the one slide or have you got the presenters mode? One slide? One slide, yeah. Cool. Okay, I'll start with the obvious. Humankind needs to learn how to manage planet Earth's resources responsibly. Uh, we're not doing that. And uh, that's been made clear so far. Uh, it's just a an image that a lot of people might have seen but really that's the sort of that's the amount of copy you get out of a hole that big i mean we, you know we are really trashing the joint but there is some good news i think a lot of people are understanding we've got to reduce the amount of stuff we consume at the moment the construction sector consumes about 150 billion tons of raw materials a year around the world and actually, uh, you know, in the UK, 60% uh, of the UK's waste, that's 120 million tonnes, is from the construction sector, a lot higher than in uh, Europe. But the good news is everyone's talking about it. these guys uh, got the biggest prize in architecture last year with a strap line, never demolish, never replace. Retrofit is a big deal. We all know that. Uh, uh, Just Stop Oil are doing their work as well. Uh, and I think, you know, we're realising we, we've got to live in a different way. Um, you know, if market forces are going to dictate where uh, we're going to get our energy, no one's going to go for fossil fuels now, but because if you, we, we're going to drift away from it as quickly as we can, it's unaffordable. And we've got to find new sources of energy, new source, new materials. And I suggest we've got to close conventional mines for obvious reasons. And we've mined enough, we've produced enough. So now we mine the Anthropocene and we nurture natural resources. And we remember that in a circular economy, you've got a biosphere and a tech sphere. And I just want to dwell on the biosphere for a minute. And I'm actually going to start with something that people probably know they think they know lots about and where's the novel material thing. But I do want to talk about sweet chestnut because in the southeast of England, where I am, we have tens of thousands of hectares of standing coppice uh, chestnut, a lot of which is not managed. It was brought over by the Romans because the timber is so durable. When it is coppiced, there's an image of the coppicing going on on the left, you, you leave a crown 
just above the ground of the of the tree for the tree. The roots don't die. The root systems and the coppices in Sussex, where I'm based, can be 400 years old. So that means that the image on the right shows you two years later. So this is a really deep carbon sink. The really brilliant point is we can use it because it's so durable. The reason the Romans brought it over is because of that. They used it to help create their roads. Um, then for a thousand years, we uh, burnt it to make charcoal and we made fence posts out of it again because you stuck it in the ground and it stayed in the ground for 15 years without rotting. But Nigel Braden here on the right did some research with the BRE in the early noughties that proved that quick growing 20 year old sweet chestnut was more durable than 300 year old oak. So leave the oak trees alone and work with this small section timber, which is a hu uh, this huge carbon sink. But also, incredibly, if you manage these human made uh, woodlands, you create a greater level of biodiversity than if you leave them alone. Which, you know, just think of that. That's incredible. And then you get this product. Now, in this case, because the timber is small section, you can see with the image on the right, perhaps you have the finger joint, lots of it together. But you can get lengths of timber that are 17 meters long. And because they're made out of lots of little bits stuck together, they don't move. So they're amazing cladding and you don't have to treat it. And you can make glue lamb columns and beams out of it. And this is a building from 2005 that we did. And this image is all sweet chestnut with a steel connector. This is a community center in Hastings and the timber grew 12 miles away from the, this uh, community center. And there it is. It was timber frame. Uh, the only bit of block work was up to DPC, of course, but then uh, the lift core had to be block work. But what you're looking at there is a pretty simple building, two stories, um, and it's uh, either sweet chestnut or it's lime, uh, plus a uh, lime render that the insulation behind it is timber fiberboard from waste uh, made out of waste timber but the insulation between the timber studs of the frame is actually flax this is my own house i had a budget of 150000 pounds it was 5 months on site 2003 this 2004 this was built uh, the timber on the side is sweet chestnut i wanted it on all sides but the planners wouldn't have it um, it's now 18 years old and looking lovely. It's basically a timber frame. Uh, it's English softwood, not treated, she sheep's wool insulation. And it came in as £150,000. I priced it at 350 pounds now. These organic materials don't need to cost loads. If you get materials coming to site to work hard for you, they have, in, you know, the rule for my house was they had to do more than one thing. White walls normal stuff from a for an architect's house perhaps these are clay walls okay so this is clay plaster is good at absorbing airborne toxins and um it also is self-finishing so we only de decorated it for the first time with clay paint a year ago the timber in the in the building is formaldehyde free ply sustainable uh timber um the only thing that we couldn't get what I wanted, which was a polished earth floor. So that is a typical polished screed floor, unfortunately. And then we do it with other projects as well. So this is a, you know, a house, we, a, a big house in Sussex, but the timber we used for, for the house is from the client's estate. And again, it's sweet chestnut. And here's uh, a round earth wall. And this is a sort of Tunbridge stone um and earth wall so that earth was on the floor in effect um and unfortunately again we haven't been able to do this sussex um earth floor now then like in 2014 i made a house made out of waste which was the local resource that we could find we i mean we got a rammed uh, chalk uh, wall in the middle of that but then we were trying to highlight things like the fact that plastic doesn't have an end these plastic products don't have an end of life strategy and that's the great thing about bio-based materials 25,000 toothbrushes, dumb. But that project attracted other research projects, including the one I just showed, which was this Interreg project, which was asking us to identify waste streams local to the waste house. And we did it in partnership with the Alliance of Sustainable Building Products, the University of Bath, Comte and Rouen. And we were charged with finding uh, two waste flows 
one to make uh might, might we try, we were asked to find uh, sorry um a textile material waste flow to turn into insulation and another waste flow to turn into a building product there was a lot of this sort of construction waste around but we found another waste stream near the waste house which is from english's oyster bar which throws away 50,000 oyster shells a year and it's these oyster shells that we then recycled, reprocessed into tiles. We also found, and you might be able to see my cursor, at the back here, you can see these are duvets. So the textile material we found um, was actually, waste textile material we found was, uh, was bedding. We went to Veolia, who are the, one of the largest waste uh, procuring companies or waste management companies in the world. They deal with Brightman Hoves Waste. And we said to them, what's your biggest pain in the neck textile waste stream? And they said immediately bedding. So we were looking at, thought we'd be looking at recycling textiles into insulation, but we actually found insulation. So in Brighton at the moment, because we've got two universities, we've got lots of hotels, it's actually cheaper to buy a new single duvet than it is to get one cleaned. So these are huge waste flows, but this is a useful product. So this material at the back, the one on the right there is uh, duck feather, 25% of all the duvets we found, we collected them for a week, were duck feather or, or, or chicken feather, and 75% were synthetic polyester. So we actually installed that into the waste house and measured its performance. And of course it works well as insulation, but what you're looking at here is a table of experiments. So experiments with, for, for example, chicken feathers reinforcing clay plasters. Um, and so these, these are experiments here with clay and ceramic materials, a bit like what you've just seen, but sort of on a DIY scale compared with stonemason that know how to do it properly. But we did make these tiles and the white ones here, I'll show you the, this slide here, the white ones are 100% oyster shells. So oyster shells fired, create quick lime, oyster shells broken up, create the aggregates to stick it all together. The pink ones have got brick um, uh, aggregates in them as well. So we're just saying that there's this, there are these materials out there or these waste flows that are actually resources that we can use. And this is interesting. This is a scheme for housing in Walthamstow in London. And the image on the left was a, a photograph taken by a client of mine who had hundred cubic meters of spoil from this site for 12 houses and uh, he didn't want to throw it away. So he turned it into hand-thrown, air-dried, non-load-bearing bricks, uh, some of which we use for this project, project and some he's got in his warehouse for the, another project. So the reason I show this, because this is clients demanding the sort of products that you just saw with the speaker before me. So I'll just remind you that we have a biosphere and a tech sphere in a circular economy. And the biosphere I've just been talking about with the timber. So you can grow, grow trees and process them into uh, things, use them, reuse them, reuse them. And as long as you don't add toxins to the timber, you can then allow it one day to enrich the earth and let things grow. But the problem is we've got a lot of stuff that isn't biodegradable and it's the tech sphere, which is the real challenge. But for a moment, I'm gonna talk about a project that we've got coming on site in a minute where we've collected a lot of the material already. And it's for a what they call a new croquet pavilion but it's not a croquet pavilion it's actually a, a sort of education facility at Glyndebourne on the South Downs and the idea there was to use as much material from the site as possible so we did a resource map and uh, we did we we can see that we found four or five material sources at, on the actual site and then some within uh, five miles and some within 10 miles of the site now, the, one, the material from one mile of the site was actually underfired and overfired bricks from a, a brickwork. So when we went to see the Chaley bricks, uh, there's a, they fire their bricks in a really old fashioned sort of 18th century way. And they have a big pile of overfired and underfired bricks that they just throw into a, into a hole, the hole that they've just dug the clay out of. So we're using that material um, for the project. We're also using food waste, grass cuttings, and as you see, number three is ash dieback. There's a lot of ash dieback at the moment, unfortunately, in, this, in the whole of the UK now. And most of it in the southeast is just being chipped um, and burnt. So we're running around Sussex at the moment, collecting ash trees to try and turn into st uh, structural material for the uh, for buildings. But we also have we've also been collecting corks, trying to work with Biome, who uh, um, 
are well known for their mycelium insulation. And we've also got loads of chalk. Every time you dig down on the South Downs where we are, you get chalk and it's a brilliant material to work with. So here's the, here's the uh, ash dieback on the left. They're actually being taken off the site at Glyndebourne and then sawn. And that's the timber, that's what you get on the right there. That's what the timber looks like. It's absolutely gorgeous. And that's the stuff that's normally chipped and burnt at the moment. And we're turning it into glue laminated structure. As I said, we've also got a lot of chalk. We're turning that into uh, plasters and renders. Um, we're not firing it um, for uh, mortar that we were thinking about doing that, but that's got a bit too much of a carbon footprint associated with it. We're also collecting glass from the site. So obviously Glyndebourne has a lot of people drinking and eating. So we collected uh, glass bottles to use as aggregates for tiles and stuff. We're also collecting the uh, these uh, corks and they're gonna be broken down and biome binding this material um, with their ORM uh, binder, organic binder, to make tiles, internal finishes for the building. And here's some of the sort of material samples. So these are tiles that go on the outside of the building um, using chalk, uh, oyster shells, uh, and aggregates from burnt bricks, um, et cetera. Now, this is, these are the tile samples for coffee and, uh, well, I'll start from the top left. The top left is a combination of um, cork, coffee, and food waste. The middle dark one is a predominantly uh, coffee granules. That's uh, grass on the top right. And then the big one on the bottom right is also uh, grass cuttings from site. And yeah, this has been published now. Uh, you can buy these, uh, Biome uh, uh, selling these light fittings that are made out of um, grass, and in this case here, earth as well. So these are the sorts of materials we're using for the pavilion. And this is a close up shot of the uh, insulation we hope to use. And I say hope to use, it's there, but it doesn't have a BBA certificate at the moment. So we won't use it unless it's got that level of certification. So even though we don't use a lot of sort of unusual stuff at the moment, we've still got to make sure the building's got the guarantees that it normally gets. So this is just, a, it's a small building. It's 150 square uh, meters. It's quite a, a normal looking building but the material sources are predominantly from site. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Um, I do want to just uh, talk about one other thing, just a word on growing roots, if I may, if I've got time. I've got two minutes. Can't hear you. Yeah, if, you, if you're quick, and then we'll go on to questions. Okay, lightweight growing roots that can go onto existing buildings. Um, it was accidentally invented, these roofs were accidentally invented in Switzerland 20 years ago. Uh, this woman here is from uh, the University of Zurich, and she's not standing on a meadow, she's standing on the roof of a chicken shed that had, um, there it is, the, the chicken farmer uh, got planning, or didn't get planning approval, um, got this uh, shed built because he needed an extra shed, and the planners came and said, you've got to knock it down, you didn't get planning approval, or you've got to hide it. So he got grass cuttings from the meadows around the shed, put them on the roof, and then so the grass cuttings didn't blow away. He put topsoil on the grass cuttings. He just thought it might work. It did work. But as you can see from the previous slide, it's hardly any substrate. It really is quite, quite light. And now if you're in Zurich or Basel, that's a bit of research, and you've got a flat roof, you put one of these roofs on. And if, I'll end with this slide. Things grow on it. It's a biodiverse environment. But this is in Zurich. This is the main tram station. That's the traditional roof there. It was 35 degrees when I was standing on this roof. Uh, and you couldn't go near those uh, that roof there because the heat coming off it was dreadful. You did not have that issue here. These roofs are implemented in uh, Switzerland because they stop um, flash flooding in urban environments. They keep you cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, we're actually going to use, hopefully going to be using the organic roots on an upcoming, upcoming project, so quite a fun one to end on. Um, we'll now open our Q&A session. Um, please keep posting questions in chat and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Um, and I will just um, add, okay, all in, great. Um, so yeah, let me just pull up the questions one second. So start with 
Um, question for Catherine. Um, there's great, great info on seagrass and algae. Would you would like to know more about the load bearing aspect that was mentioned? Yeah, I think um, I thought Duncan's presentation would like touch on this a bit more, but I did like a preliminary uh, compression test, but it was on a brick that I had developed with um, with shell again, using it similarly to quick lime and using it as an aggregate as well. And it performed similarly to concrete um, in, in the compression test, but it's just a preliminary test. And it was done kind of, you know, in a university setting. So there's definitely more research needed for this. But I grew up going to Florida my whole life and seeing the florts in Florida. And they were built from, uh, from quick lime, from shells. They had no limestone down in Florida. So all these massive Spanish forts are just built from shells. They also use shells to build in the Faroe Islands and other coastal cities. So, I mean, this is like, it's, it's just a great, you know, concrete material. It, it, you don't have to heat it as much as you have to heat regular limestone. Um, I think you only heat it to about 800 degrees Celsius. So um, yeah, I don't know why we're not using it and why everyone's eating shellfish and throwing away the shells. I mean, Catherine, it's the same around the UK. The, the coastal uh, for, uh, fortifications around the UK are the same. And um, I mean, we, we got the, these tiles tested for frost and um, yeah, fr frost action basically um, and compression uh, in a local laboratory uh, that, you know, tests building materials. So that's as far, and, that, and that's how we can use it on other buildings off university premises. That's that awesome. actually leads on to a question, Duncan. Um, which was someone's asking how easy it is to get a BB, BBA certification for novel materials um, that you've well, developed yourselves. Yeah, okay. Well, if Ehab from Biome was here, he would point out that they've been trying to get a BBA certificate for their bio, for, sorry, they are Biome, for their uh, mycelium installation for the last two, two years. And um, the last feedback I got, because we're just waiting for the certification um, uh, to, to use it, um, he said, he said the problem is with the BBAs, when they normally give product certifications, they can look at a case study on their own books, something they've already given an approval to. Uh, and of course, this is novel. And, um, and therefore, they don't have a benchmark or a case study they can refer to. So they've been very thorough. They're not, they're, they're confident they're going to get it. Um, but the BBA have been very, very thorough because it's the first material like that that, that will have had a uh, certification. So it could open the floodgates for other similar materials, I would say. Thank you. Uh, got a question for Ward, uh, which is a question about if there are any implications for costs and uh, are these materials going to be more expensive? Um, I think most of these materials are more expensive. Our, our products are more expensive as well. Um, it's also but when you actually zoom in on why it is more expensive, for instance, for the waste-based bricks, we we found out that uh, we use waste materials. These waste materials have to be processed. But a lot of the big brick-making companies, they own uh, the places where they excavate the clay uh, historically. So they don't pay for the material itself. They only pay for the excavation. So that's uh, that, that's those factors also uh, are uh, are there. Um, uh, so it's not really a, a equal uh, uh, playing field, I would say. Um, the other thing is that uh, uh, skill is also uh, is also an issue. Um, um, we produce at a relatively small scale. We make 2 million bricks uh, this year, which is uh, very small compared to most factories that create 30, 40, 50 million bricks per year per factory. Uh, so that's, a, uh, that, that's also a big difference. Um, um, so my my guess is that it will take some time uh, before uh, these materials will get the same uh, price level unless governments uh, start putting in place regulations that actually say well if you produce them in an unethical way or if you use a lot of energy to produce your products then there are extra taxes to uh, so that uh, said also that also the shadow costs are being paid of these kind of uh, products uh, but for the moment, these products are more expensive. Uh, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, got a question for Catherine. Um, you mentioned a natural binder. Is this found, binder found in other plants and could it be used instead of synthetic binders used in existing bioinsulation? So that's referring to things like sheep's wool insulation that often has a plastic binder included in it. 
Yeah, a lot of, uh, so a lot of actual uh, natural insulation products actually do compl- contain like a thermoplast binder. Um, and I was mentioning this, I actually did comment on this in the group chat if people scroll up, but I'll just add on to what I said. Um, the problem with using natural binders for insulation in particular is that a lot of natural binders in a closed wall cavity setting could rot. Um, so it's really difficult to make insulation materials in particular uh, with natural binders, unless you're using some sort of preservative or um, yeah, there's a way for that to like dry out, like you're using clay um, as a, a uh, binder or like hempcrete blocks. Uh, for example, the lime and the clay is drying. So you can use that in combination with uh, fiber as well. Um, so I think, I think that's one of the challenges of using natural binders um, with, with insulation in general. But a lot of people use uh, natural binders like different glues and stuff for acoustic or cladding materials because that can dry out that doesn't have to like diffuse moisture as, as effectively as a, as a, a ventilation in a wall cavity would have to do. Um, so that's why too, like in Denmark, a lot of the paints that are used on the facades, like in Copenhagen, just honestly, just animal glues and uh, chalk and natural pigments are, are the base of most of them. And they've been doing that for hundreds of years. Um, so iron, iron uh, ore, um, powdered makes red, um, chalk makes white, you know, so all these natural pigments you see in Copenhagen on the walls on the facades are made from like milk glue, are made from like bone glue. So it's super fascinating. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Duncan, got a question, um, well, this could apply to Ward as well, actually, um, on how are you storing all the materials you're collecting and how are contractors reacting to the different material experiments? I, I, I think I'm working on sort of more of a DIY level than Ward. So I think it's, it's interesting. We do, I'm working on a recipe last project where we're, we've just collected 35 tons of chalk and graded it, waiting for it to become the chalk plaster of, of um, the, this building we're doing. And uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the contractors suddenly getting a bit sort of shaky about the performance. Even though the contractor's done it before with us, which with, with uh, the same same material, but because he's actually seen it graded on the site, it chemically it's exactly the same. So I, I think it is early days. And um, but um, you know that the, we work basically we work with um, building conservation experts because they're lime technology experts and they're used to these materials. So you sort of have to get them on site and say, well, this is the traditional way of doing it, actually. This is how it would have been done in this area where we are uh, on the South Downs. So, you know, that's why there's lots of chalk pits everywhere because they were dug to make lime, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely something that people get a bit sort of shaky and wobbly. They, they'd r- much rather it arrive from a local, you know, Juicens or whatever than, um, uh, than actually come from, you know, the site where they're digging out the holes. I think, I think that's quite uh, familiar. I mean, uh, it's definitely a, a, a different skill that we try to do these things, but uh, the reaction, reaction in the market is quite similar. Uh, 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 somebody who builds a building, a construction company, at least in the Netherlands, they are uh, 10, years, 10 years responsible for the quality of the building. So what happens if you are 10 years responsible, uh, you, uh, you want to build with materials that you know, because then you know uh, the, that, that it will be okay. Uh, so that's actually uh, a contradiction uh, when it comes to it, uh, it doesn't help innovation. So for us, for the last eight years, uh, we did so much of talking, 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 and also working uh, together with uh, uh, research organizations that the industry knows. Uh, and in the end, uh, we figured out it, it, uh, it, it requires a certain type of client that is willing to push through. And I think that's maybe not even different uh, from what Duncan is do- doing. It requires a client that says, well, uh, we know that it's new. We know that maybe there are risks, uh, but we're gonna try it anyway, because it's, it's important to, de- to do these things. And, and now that we have our, uh, now that we have done quite a, quite a few projects in different countries, uh, the perceived risk by the contractors is smaller and it's not an issue anymore. Uh, uh, but it takes, yeah, it takes a lot of time convincing, talking, taking people by the hand and really explaining the story over and over again. 
I think we're sort of getting, yeah, running out of time a bit now. Um, possibly just a, a, a general question, really, at the end. Um, uh, sort of, you sort of slightly touched on this already just then, Ward, but um, if there's any other big, um, big barriers that you're facing getting um, these more novel materials into mainstream industry. One of the big barriers for me, at least, well, besides not being Danish and working in Denmark, <laughs> which is very <laughs> challenging in itself. In Denmark, about 20 years ago, there was a very cheap, very um, highly used windbreaker board used in the majority of buildings. And that molded before its time, its time and basically uh, caused a huge headache for the entire building industry. And since then, the building industry here has become even more conservative. So when I first started working with Seagrass, um, I was very unpopular. I had people tell me that I was romanticizing history and that it was stupid and, uh, you know, oh, like, how dare I? <laughs> Uh, which I th was very shocked because, you know, I had, I had lived in Japan where craftspeople really took pride in their building traditions and it was seen as something very usable to this day. So I was very shocked. I had a very big culture shock that that was something so um, hostile in Denmark. And then about two years ago, the bio-based train started rolling and now more and more people are getting excited about materials and actually putting more in experiments into place and putting funding behind experiments. But I would say that that conservatism and that initial pushback was, was quite difficult. Um, so it definitely affected the trajectory of my work, I think, for quite some time. Yeah, I, I think uh, I really see a big role for governments uh, here. I think um, um, when I talk to, to real estate developers and architects, uh, and even construction companies, everybody wants to do, do, do things in a different way. But it takes governments to say, uh, uh, or legislation to say, okay, this is, this is what we expect from buildings. And uh, we are now in this transition period where, uh, where governments say, if you use this material, then you get a tax incentive or something like that. It's still on the, uh, I give you something extra when you do it, but I think we need to go to the, I give you a penalty when you don't do it. And, uh, and People want it, but uh, we also need clarity from our governments, or uh, on this side of the of, of, of the of the North Sea, uh, from from the European Union, uh, to say, okay, this is what we this is what how we want to build our cities and our buildings, and on every everybody just needs to uh, go along with that, because then the major industries will start putting money in these de developments. Um, I think we probably need to wrap up now. Um, we've gone over an hour. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, thank you to everyone for coming.